get a movie too. It's time to open the room to comments, and for that, we're going to have uh, our professor, Martha Matsuoka, who will uh, facilitate our comments. Let's give a big hand to the folks on the stage, really. <laughs> Such, really, quite, I mean, it's an extraordinary privilege to be able to host this here at Occidental College. Oh, some of them are sitting here. Welcome. Um, you know, having this leadership, um, not only at the national level, but locally here in Los Angeles has been tremendous. Um, gives us an opening to do all the things we've always wanted to do for some time now. Um, we're thrilled to fill this um, Great Thorn Hall to capacity, which you all should know is 792. So consider yourself, this is for us part of a movement, so we think this is great here in Los Angeles. Um, we're going to start this part of the session. First, if everyone could just stand up. We know you've been sitting a long time. As this First Lady Michelle Obama says, you know, we need to move. This is the Great Outdoors Initiative. We're trapping you inside. But, so just stand up. You know, take a big couple of breaths, stretch. Okay. Now, everybody sit down. <laughs> Great. So what we're going to do now is um, take some comments from the floor um, based on what we heard. We're going to, um, we want people to keep their comments direct and open and relatively short so we can hear as many comments as possible. I see hands going already. Um, what we're going to do is, I see people standing up in the back. So we're going to, we have microphones. Um, let me see where they are. They're floating. Um, Sylvia Chico has one. Uh, there's Professor Gottlieb here in the middle. And um, we have one here, here. So we're gonna, gonna try to point as people <laughs> kind of raise their hands. So there's a number of things. Let me, let me remind us too that we're gonna listen here today. We're also gonna break out into smaller um, breakout sessions following this session in about uh, half an hour or so. So we're gonna have ample time to be face to face with some of our senior leadership so that we can actually share some of the things that we're concerned about and what we wanna promote in this great initiative. So let me see, um, while we start on that side of the room, I'm um, going to have Professor Gottlieb hand the microphone to Hello. OK, thank you. My name is Alexa Delwich, and I'm coordinating a task force on food policy that was announced by Mayor Viragosa last fall. And I just want to say thank you so much for being here. This is just very inspiring and exciting to have you all here. Um, the task force was asked to look at how the city, city and county could help strengthen the incredible work that's going on in Los Angeles around food system change as a tool to create good jobs, uh, improve public health, improve the environment, increase equity in our communities, um, and increase access to good, good food. So rebuilding our regional and local food systems are critical to advancing environmental agendas, public health agendas, and, and really uh, for driving an economic recovery agenda. We've seen a lot of really incredible work being done. Some of it's around farm to school programs, uh, building a regional food hub to reconnect small and mid-sized farmers within, within Los Angeles and within the region, and getting that, that food to uh, institutional purchasers, but using land use policies to support food system, system change, all, all of these ideas I think could be a really great addition to the agenda that you're, you're putting together. Thank you so much. We're going to try not to respond unless it's, if you really, really need an answer, because that way we'll maximize time for people. Perfect. Like Perfect. Okay, let's move on to this side of the room. How about the woman right here? Someone will bring your microphone. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Elizabeth Glau, and I would like to point out that Generation Y doesn't know the difference between Yosemite and Yellowstone. Many people I talk to know that they should visit Yosemite and other parks, but marketing they see is luring them to other destinations. The irony is that folks from other countries recognize America's national parks as our country's greatest asset. A lot of people believe that the parks are either always crowded or closed. A few of the largest parks do reach capacity, but only on a few days of the year. Many lesser known parks are so lightly attended that they are in danger of being irrelevant to the American people. Think about how most people make their buying decisions, including where to spend their hard-earned vacation time. 
They make these choices based on messages and other information they receive in their daily lives. Although the vehicles for advertising might be changing, the message needs to be shared so that more people under 30 and more minorities will become aware of national parks and make the choice to visit. This will provide valuable personal interaction with nature and help to ensure the future public support for the parks. Great, thank you very much. Um, one of the, I'm gonna go, uh, one of the things, this is Professor Prerogative, just a second. So um, one of the great resources we have here at Occidental College is youth. And I know that there's a huge emphasis on the youth. So I'm gonna send the next question out to some folks in, in the back here. Um, we have a very great um, set of new students who are coming to campus as part of our Multicultural Summer Institute. Um, they're here right in the back. Um, and so I wanna welcome them to Occidental College because this is their first week on campus. And, <laughs> See if we can get a comment from one of them. Uh, hi, I'm Leah. I'm from New Jersey. Um, and I'm wondering, where does the money to fund all of this come from? <laughs> Congress, it involves uh, what it is that we want to invest in. You know, I, I have a point of view on these issues, uh, which is my point of view as uh, the Secretary, and that is that uh, there's a broken promise to the American people in investing in conservation, and uh, we need to live up to the promise that was made long ago. In the land of the, the video that you just saw on the America's Great Outdoors essentially is a legacy that uh, Teddy Roosevelt and, and that generation of conservationists uh, left us. But if you look back at the last hundred years, most of what we have done in conservation has been funded on the backs of uh, anglers and uh, hunters uh, here in America. And we need to fund it in a broader way. Uh, in the 1960s, in my office, uh, Stuart Udall and Bobby Kennedy and Henry Diamond sat in that office and they envisioned the creation of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the concept being that you take the resources from our Earth, whether it's oil and gas on the onshore or on the offshore, and that you dedicate uh, those funding streams for land and water conservation. Uh, and so President Kennedy sent a letter to the Congress, and the Land and Water Conservation Fund was created some years later, but it has only been funded one time fully funded, and that was in 1977, at a level of $900 million. If you were to adjust that for inflation, uh, it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $3.4 million. Uh, billion dollars, $3.4 billion. And that does not take into account some of the needs that we are hearing about as we cross all, of, you know, all over America with respect to what we do with uh, youth and environmental education with respect to the great urban parks for America, with respect to the landscapes of national significance. So this is part of the dialogue that uh, this nation has to have, and that's part of the reason that we're here. Okay, let's see, how do we go? We'll go on that side of the room again. How about um, uh, Joe, right there in the back. Yeah, I, I, I'm grateful that we've got this incredible dream team and that, that there's a real uh, focus on urban parks and urban issues and uh, great that the LA River is indeed navigable, yay. Um, but I, I want to bring up just a connection to, if we look at some of our biggest resource issues from uh, global warming to uh, the Gulf oil spill, um, something that's missing from this panel, from this dream team, is transportation. And, and that we really need to look at bicycling and walking and other greener modes of transportation. I'm curious how it, uh, Ray LaHood's been a phenomenal cabinet secretary and I, I hope you guys are working with him and um, 
uh, sort of refocusing some of our transportation dollars into the America's Great Outdoors Initiative. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Why don't we go? We're going to bounce around here a little bit. Um, how about um, right here in the middle, Melanie? Hi, uh, my name is Meredith McCarthy. I'm director of programs at Heal the Bay. Um, one of our large project areas um, in the Compton Creek watershed um, has uh, occurred to me today. There's a, a piece missing here also, which is education. And when we come, uh, when I talk to the teachers in Compton, they all say, oh, we'd love to get our kids involved in your program but we're stuck with uh, all children left inside, also known as no child left behind. Um, <laughs> and it was of the roughly 50,000 children that we educate um, throughout the course of the year, um, that is the overall response from the teachers, that they are trapped inside because they're teaching to a test. Um, they would like nothing more than to uh, introduce their students to a hands-on approach to get them outside, um, but they feel trapped. So I'd like to work on that in a huge way. Thank you. About that back of the room, someone back there. I can't see very well, so we're going to pass the mic around to somebody with their hand up right there in the back. Thank you for being here in our beautiful state. Uh, we appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this. Um, I would like to just make a comment about uh, renewable energy. And I, re I appreciate the administration's push for renewable energy. Uh, obviously, it's very important for all of us. But I would like you to take into consideration that our desert, which is also an incredible treasure to California, our beautiful Mojave Desert and our Sonoran Desert, that it is, should not become a parking lot for solar panels and wind development and geothermal. So, uh, while I, I think it can be done in a responsible way with using common sense um, and a variety of stakeholders, I'd like you to consider that. And, and I know the desert's often considered as a giant wasteland. Um, and people think, you know, it's this thing I have to drive through on the way to Vegas. Um, and it's unfortunate because those people never get out the I-15 and they never get out there and really explore it. And I would encourage uh, any of you to take a visit out there and you'll see why it shouldn't be covered in, in solar panels. Thank you. Why don't we stay on that side of the room and move the microphone further in the middle? So get, keep going, Bob. <laughs> right. Yeah, how about somebody right in there to the left, your left, right there. Notice when they gave out the microphone, all the men around me said, no, I get to do it. Um, on your website, my name is Meg, and I work for the Off-Road Business Association. I'm here to represent the off-road industry, off-roaders in general. We do the majority of our um, recreating on public lands, and I noticed there was very few mention of OHV recreation, almost none in your presentation, and that was very, very disappointing. Um, <clears throat> on your website, you have a list of four questions that you want answered, so I'm just gonna give the answers to them. Is that okay? okay. Um, challenges uh, for the OHV community, our current riding areas are always getting decreased for various reasons. We'd like to see them congressionally designated. That protects them from further encroachment and from solar energy and a bunch of other things. Um, what works, we'd encourage the federal government to come out and look at one of our California state, state vehicular recreation areas. The, at, at those areas, the environment is, is protected and responsible OHV recreation happens and families go out there and use them all the time. Um, another thing that, this third question is how can the federal government be more effective partner in helping achieve conservation recreation and reconnecting people to the outdoors? 
I think that strongly feel that every, in, every agency that manages land for the federal government should create a comprehensive OHV recreation plan. To my knowledge, none of them have one. Here in the state of California, we have a million registered off-highway vehicles, and many families, as a matter of fact, I think in the southern five counties, there are 500,000 registered OHVs, and not a single one of the agencies that manages land has a comprehensive OHV recreation plan. And that's doing a disservice to the people that recreate, to the people that make their money from OHV, and also doing a disservice to the environment because we need to manage this use. Um, our, the last question is tools. What additional tools and resources would help your efforts be even more successful? Um, OHV recreation in the, you know, in the federal budgets is horribly underfunded. Um, we need money for basic operating tools like trail maps, trail signs, and trail maintenance. I see other forms of recreation get funded to a much higher degree than OHV recreation does, and we would like to see that our recreation fully funded. Thank you very much. So this is a good reminder too that they're on their website, the, uh, the Great American Outdoors website, there is a place to go online and leave your comments, and so I encourage everybody to do this, right? I mean, just in the same way this woman is, has um, reminded us. Okay, how about, um, I'm gonna bounce over here now. How about over here? Woman stand right, right there, yes. Someone will get you microphone. Thank you, I'm Sandra Cattell with the Sierra Club. In northern LA County, there's an effort to connect the two segments of the uh, Angeles National Forest. It is a vital linkage area and efforts are uh, being made to put the private undeveloped land into public ownership. We are trying to stop a 56 million ton sand and gravel mine in this area. There is bipartisan legislation by Barbara Boxer and Buck McKeon that is currently backed by all local elected officials, the local communities, and environmental organizations, including the Sierra Club. Secretary Salazar, we need your help, along with the entire Dream Team, to help this happen. Thank you very much. Amanda, so how about right here in the, um, somewhat the hand of the back in the dark sleeve, right there, you just turn around. Right there, stand up. <laughs> yes, My name's you. Oh, thank sorry. you. You can do it. <laughs> My name is Henry Ortiz. I work with the Nature Bridge, which is an um, outdoor environmental science program that we do um, throughout California and Washington. And um, I think creating parks and open space is a great idea. I really laud the whole team for doing this and, and backing these efforts. But once these parks are established, who's going to take care of these parks? And so. Um, we have a lot of parks in Los Angeles. We have a lot of beaches in Los Angeles and, and throughout the Southland here. Uh, what we really need most is to get kids out to these parks. And we need to get, we, we need to get them out to these places where I'd say the majority of them have never been. And if I was to ask people here in this audience, how many people have been, for example, to a national park that's right around the corner, Channel Islands National Park. Um, I would venture to guess that 90% of the people in this audience have never been there. And one of the reasons is probably because of transportation issues. So that's one. Um, but I think what we need most is to get these kids out to, there to show them what they really have, their, their national heritage. And um, more than anything else, we need to teach them to be stewards and advocates of these places. Two things I think that we really need in Los Angeles specifically. One is public transportation to these sites so that kids that couldn't otherwise get there with their family could. And the second thing is funds for students to participate with their teachers in outdoor residential environmental science programs where we can really engage where we can really engage their critical reasoning skills around issues about the environment because they're the, the future of efforts like this. So I hope that you take those two things into consideration. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I was gonna hand the microphone next to the woman in the dark blue blouse here. She was, had her hand up and stood up, but she didn't get a chance to grab the microphone.
Hi, my name is Natasha Walton. Um, I'm really glad that you brought up the concern about urban parks. Um, we, I wish, you know, our city council could have listened to you because we lost another portion of our park to more development. We have a, um, a hockey center, 40,000 square foot hockey center that went out of business. Um, it was a 40 acre park, now it's fragmented. We have beautiful oak trees, sycamore trees. It's been there for over um, 50 years. Um, um, it's, it has a lot of, it's a Morrow Park in Upland in San Bernardino County. And uh, the YMCA came in and, and built structures there and some of them are um, recreational, other ones we don't know what they're for. Um, we have daycares there. We have things that are more of infrastructural structures there. We just recently had um, a 17,000 square foot animal shelter built in there and it was designated for another spot in the city, a light industrial area that was more appropriate and um, concerned citizens in the city. They were tired of seeing their park being um, cut up and fragmented and so we um, filed a lawsuit and it was thrown out of the courts because of a, um, because of a, just a technicality basically. It wasn't even based on the merits of the case because they did not do an EIR. They did not do, um, there were several state laws that protect California parks from non-recreational development. The facility is actually under the, um, under the police department. And so, and they had other public land in the area, um, a city yard where they had space available, but they did not do any kind of cost analysis for that site. And so we, we fought this and we lost because of the technicality and we need help from the federal government for our city parks. So and one of the things we're asking you is, for, is maybe to provide some economic incentive to our politicians to protect our parks because that's the only thing a lot of these guys care about is money. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, how many are Thanks. Uh, Andy Lipkiss, president of Tree People. Uh, thank you. We are really excited that you were here and coming back and demonstrating something that we are asking for, which is integration. I want to underline what works. The stories that you've seen today and the last couple of days of looking around are star examples of cooperation, collaboration of incredible agencies from the city of LA, the county, Nonprofits from across the board. Cecilia underscored it. I want to add one word to the investment we need to make stuff work, which is smart. Smart, green infrastructure. What ha isn't working, going by the, the form, is when your agencies don't work together and collaborate, and when you have policies that pre prevent our agencies from doing multi-purpose projects and collaborating, any project that's done today as a single purpose project hemorrhages cash, resources like water or energy, and human capital, people. What we need from you, what the role of the federal government is to incentivize local agencies to work together to build multi-purpose projects like the ones you were standing on. Parks that harvest rainfall, not just putting it in the ground, but put it in tanks, make it available for urban agriculture, for trees, for quality of life, and most importantly, for jobs. Uh, and so what we need from you is to actually, we would love to ask you to deploy a team from each of your agencies and the ones missing to actually work together, authorized by you, almost like an emergency ecosystem command center for the country, to allow that kind of thinking to happen in our communities. That's when we start getting out of the box to solve the urgency that's really hurting us and making us susceptible to climate change. We're ready to rise to the occasion. We need your partnership, we need your authority, we need your validation. So the best projects rise to the top and are supported by you to make our local heroes real champions so they can get out of the box with your support. Thank you. Okay. So my front row. Here you go. So I'm going to turn it over to my microphone to somebody in the front row here. Thank you. I'm not representing an organization. However, I do have a background uh, of having worked uh, for agriculture. Uh, my wife and I were fire lookouts up in Idaho. During college, I worked in Glacier Park for a concessioner. I worked for, in the Tetons for the National Park Service. 
and we've, we've done a lot of stuff over the years. And that inspired me, maybe an advocate for the out of doors, for the parks, for the forest service. I think with the state of the economy the way it is, projections for slow growth and jobs, uh, there should be some inspiration in the federal agencies to provide more, put jobs back in the national parks and in the national forests for people maybe during their breaks from college or for youth. Uh, the CCC had a marvelous program. I'm not saying that it's time to redo the CCC, but you get people working seasonally in these jobs and there's work to be done. They become advocates for these resources for the rest of their life, at least many of them will be. And you're putting people to work, so it's not wasted money. So that's my, with this few little time I have to speak, that's the one point I'd like to make. Okay, I'm gonna go to this side of the room now. Um, how about this woman right here? Thank you, welcome to Los Angeles. My name is April Wakeman, I'm with the Sport Fishing Conservancy. We're recreational fishermen. We completely agree with the president. However, whether under the guise of budget issues or environmental problems, we're finding that our outdoors available to outdoor enthusiasts are shrinking. Money's a problem. We've got to stop adding to the uh, threatened species, but outdoor enthusiasts are gonna add to that. Instead of an outdoor enthusiast, when they see their sport being taken away, take it as a threat to them, these people need to be incorporated. I suggest incorporate all of us in the process. Mm -hmm. If an outdoor area has a budget problem, get the users to come together and find a way to fund it. If it's an environmental problem, again, get the users together to see if there's a way to solve that problem. We may not be able to solve the problem, but at least they understand why the area is being taken away. And surprise of surprises, even the, the people, the off-road vehicle drivers who seem to be the most hated, are gonna support you because they too believe in the out of doors. And, and I, have, I have a challenge for the federal government, and I hate to single you out, Under Secretary Harris, Look at the motto, vision, and guiding principles of the Forest Service. Recreation doesn't show up. Let's put recreation and people back in what we're working for. We can coexist. Over here, the mark front of over here. Hi, I'm Madeline. I'm a, going to be a UCLA grad student in urban planning, and I was actually an organizer on the Obama campaign in Colorado, and we had the privilege of working with you, Secretary Salazar, and I know how important these issues are, are to you, so I really appreciate you being here and listening to us. Um, so one thing I've been thinking about, and something that I think you all understand because you're here in Los Angeles, is this part of this initiative should just be about bringing us in the urban cities to the great outdoors, but bringing the great outdoors to the urban cities as well. And I was an affordable housing organizer here in Los Angeles, and something that I've been thinking about since then is you know, integrating things like edible landscapes and community gardens into smart and affordable developments such as those. I think that's not only a way to bring green space back to the urban environment, but make it accessible and equitable to low-income folks in our cities. Thanks of the solution of this problem. Riding horses gives Americans a past, a link to their past, and a chance to see and experience the great American outdoors in public lands from horseback, as the early settlers and explorers did. Also, in the private farmland, sufficient land to breed, raise and provide food for the nine million horses in this country requires a minimum of three, 36 million acres. That's four acres per horse. The equestrian activities can also play an important part in the physical activities that our young people need. As the First Lady has suggested, uh, physical activity is extremely important to youngsters 
and horseback riding provides an alternative which should be an option. In addition to being a healthy activity, horseback riding provides, and the equestrian activities in general, provide over $32 billion a year to the U.S. economy and provides employment for more than 435,000 Americans. Also, many Americans with physical impairments ride horses. Multiple sclerosis victims are benefit from horse therapy. Uh, I've represented horsemen, many horsemen across the country. Here, the government issue is, I represented horsemen before the Orange County supervisors. Uh, a horse hater moved into a horse community that had been a horse community for more than 75 years and proposed a zoning standard that would have forced out all horses. Urbanization is one of our biggest problems. I've also represented disabled people seeking access to horse facilities, uh, which are uh, very important as recreation to those who can't walk themselves. In conclusion, thank you so much for listening. The horse community, which is a, a large and important concerned part of the community that wants to conserve our environment, environment make our country better, needs your sponsorship, needs your protection, needs your foresight. Please think of us when you are doing the planning and legislating uh, to solve our country's problems uh, in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, um, right here in the middle. Uh, I don't see a microphone close to you. Um, it's going over there, okay. So the microphone's gonna go there. I'll come back to you all. <laughs> Hi, my name is Elva Yanez. I'm an open space advocate here in Northeast LA, and thank you for coming to our neighborhood. I want to reiterate or reinforce the uh, Secretary's comments about a, a steady funding stream coming down from the federal government to not only fund urban parks and open space, but to incentivize local funding from the cities and the counties. There's got to be a way to create that steady source of funding. In California, we don't have that for state parks. We don't have it really for the local parks in a meaningful way. That is why we are one of the most park poor communities in the country. We need to incentivize. City of LA spends $35 per year on parks and open space compared to some of our other great cities of California that spend $278, $280 per year. We need that incentive from the federal government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're gonna bring the microphone down the same aisle. <laughs> uh, yes, stay standing. The young woman in the blue shirt, Bob. Bob, come down. Hi. <laughs> Okay, I hear another microphone. Well, the someplace. microphone's moving okay. down. I'll just go really quickly. Um, my name's Sam Goldman. I'm uh, an organizer with the Wilderness Society. One thing that's really working well is that we've been able to designate millions of acres of new wilderness around uh, the state of California. And last year, President Obama signed the Omnibus Public Land Management Act. Thank you all for your help with that. I see my uh, that protected uh, 700,000 acres plus of uh, wild lands around the state, and we were able to work with. Uh, local communities, ranchers, ORV, um, our friends in the OHV communities who I see here today. Uh, so we're working really well um, on that front together. And we're going to be working to designate more wilderness. And last night, 400 people came out to the San Gabriel Valley uh, to Whittier Narrows Park to talk about the San Gabriel Mountains and the importance of designating new wilderness and wild rivers there. Um, and we do need the federal government's help in working to uh, protect uh, the recreation interests um, and uh, the values of the San Gabriel Mountains for future generations. So when your report comes out, we look forward to hearing about um, your ideas and your thoughts and how we can uh, really promote the San Gabriel Mountains much like the Santa Monica Mountains have been protected. So we uh, look forward to seeing that and thank you again for being here in Los Angeles. So, uh, so thank you very much. Our last question is going to go to the young woman here, and I see lots of hands, and I don't want to discourage anybody. I think you should keep your hands raised, and we're going to, we're going to talk about where you can take those hands to, to, to keep providing um, more information to our panelists. But let me turn the last big public question to over to this young woman here. My name is Jill Bays. I'm with Transition Habitat Conservancy. We're a land trust located in the West Mojave Desert along the San Gabriel Mountain North Slope. So we're on the other side of the San Gabriels. 
Uh, we're an all-volunteer organization trying to preserve private land, that's all we have in our community, in an unincorporated part of San Bernardino County. And um, we're trying to acquire land to reconnect our youth to natural places. The state of California bond freeze has blocked all of our grants, so it's really important that the Land and Water Conservation Fund get fully funded and also that it get changed so that grants can be made directly to the local land trusts, the 1,600 local land trusts in this country who know what are the best places in their communities to preserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I think at this point in the program, I get to turn it back over to Administrator Jackson, she, and then we'll talk about what's next. So hold on to those questions. Okay, well, okay. We're gonna, we're gonna take, take all that. Okay. Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna have, okay, have a seat. We're gonna, we're gonna get to all that. I know everybody has similar kinds of things they wanna share. We're gonna come around to that in the breakout sessions, but I just wanna wrap up this section first. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for uh, your views. Uh, we heard a lot of extraordinary things and uh, we're running a bit behind. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, tell you that we hear messages about funding, about the importance of uh, listening to local voices, empowering local communities who have been and understand where the touch points and the bottlenecks and the frustrations and the passions are around issues. We want to thank each and every one of uh, the constituencies who were heard in terms of their uh, being willing to uh, bravely share their views of how they see uh, and value uh, America's outdoor spaces. And I, I, I just want to say that on behalf of all of us, and I'll, I'll ask everybody to say literally 15 seconds of thanks, uh, how grateful we are to Occidental uh, college and to uh, the staff here who made us welcome and to all the students and folks who came. Thank you, Professor Matsuoka, Matsuoka for your extraordinary facilitation of a very activist group. We expected nothing less from California. Please stick around. I want to thank all of our staff, especially EPA staff. This was EPA's uh, baby. Uh, every one of us takes it uh, takes responsibility for meeting. My staff did a wonderful job, but so did the staffs of all the agencies, and uh, uh, the city was very helpful as well. So we want to thank everybody here, but especially Dan Cannonan, who uh, will kill me for naming him, but who did a wonderful job, along with Rob Golding, of pulling this together. We're going to move now to uh, breakout sessions, and uh, we'll hear a little bit about that. Does anybody else have anything they just want to uh, acknowledge they heard? Or All right. Oh, oh, wait, just one. Just, just, one, one, just one quick point. For those of you who have commented on for service issues with recreation or other types of activities, I just want to really remind you, we are going through a national planning rule right now. And you're going to be hearing more about this this year. but. I really would urge you to pay attention to it. You can go to our website, but a lot of the issues that you're talking about will be dealt with directly through the National Planning Rule, and we would love your participation and involvement in that. Thank you. Well, let's give them another hand, really. I mean, can you... Martha. Yes. Martha, Professor, uh, let me... I hear... Who's hold on, it's here? back here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I think it's only fair since uh, there are lots of uh, questions that have been raised, maybe while we are here uh, to respond to at least a few of the questions, and I, we could spend a whole afternoon doing it. Let me just take three of the ones that have been raised. Um, one is uh, the whole general approach to conservation. This is, in my view, a an effort that will continue to lead into a march on Washington, a march for conservation that this country very much needs. And it is very much dependent on all of you continuing to follow this effort in the weeks and months ahead because we together 
will write uh, the next century of conservation for the country number two. A comment uh, with respect to renewable energies and the conflicts in the Mojave Desert and other places, we believe we can do both. We believe we can stand up a new energy future for the United States of America. It is a high priority of President Obama. It's a high priority of his cabinet, and we are going to do that because we have to get rid of our over-reliance on fossil fuels. At the same time, at the same time as we stand up thousands of megawatts of, of power in uh, Nevada and California and other places, we need to be thoughtful of the environment. Uh, this morning, Secretary Chu and I and uh, Senator Reid in Nevada announced a solar power demonstration zone, which is being created there. Uh, and we envision that there's going to be 17,000 megawatts of solar power that we're going to be able to create. It's a lot of power. That's the equivalent of what you generate from about 51 coal-fired power plants. Okay, so it's a lot of power. But your point in terms of doing it right uh, so that we're not uh, essentially moving into places where we have ecological values that need to be protect protected means that we have to take Bob Abbey's, uh, who's the director of the LM's point, which is we have to be smart from the start. We have to put them in the right places so we're not trampling over other important national values. <laughs> and the third, and, uh, the third and, and, and final point is lots of great ideas have come up. Uh, some of them are controversial. You know, your point here on horses and your passion. Understand. Uh, but none of the questions that we face in this world, whether they're the issues of war and peace, whether they're issues of energy, whether they're the issues of conservation and development, have easy answers. Okay? Uh, and what, what, here, what, 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 I have, what I have done and what I will do is to continue to work to try to come up with sensible solutions, and I don't pretend to be the person that has the best of all of those answers. And the last and, and final thing uh, that I will say is that um, on the part of the President, uh, what he has done is to direct his cabinet uh, to essentially listen to the people of this country as we craft the conservation agenda. It is not uh, an easy thing, frankly, for a President to make a decision that he is going to host a White House conference on conservation. But yet he decided that he wanted to do that because he knows that the voices that are out there from California to Florida to Colorado, all over this country, uh, have a stake in this. And so we hope to be able to move forward with you to craft this conservation agenda for the 21st century that we as America will be proud of not only in 10 years from now, but 100 years from now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Secretary Salazar. Thank you, everyone on the panel. That was, for us, sort of a call to action, right? And so I know there were lots of hands up just now. There's a lot of passion in the room. There's a lot of compassion in the room. There's just a lot of activism, as you mentioned. And so what's going to happen next is we're going to break out into smaller, smaller sessions so we can continue the conversation, so you continue to raise your issues, um, come up with solutions, have one-on-ones with senior officials. Thank you very much.